really isn't very difficult to believe that the capacities that we have are purely temporal. I think you'll agree with that. That the physical and the mental abilities that we have this morning are not going to last forever. If you uh, were to look at LBJ or at Harry Truman or at a relative as they lie in the casket, it's uh, very easy to believe that the abilities that we have ourselves are going to end up like that also and that they just are not going to last forever. Yet the strange paradox is that there's probably not one of us here in the theatre this morning who doesn't feel that we ought to last forever. Isn't that true? It doesn't matter how cool or how cynical you are about life, the idea seems somehow ridiculous that this complicated personality that we have and this intricate world in which we live is all going to end after 70 or 80 years. The idea seems illogical, doesn't it? That's the strange thing about us. The abilities we have seem to be purely temporal, and yet there's something inside us that makes us feel we ought to live forever. We're made to live forever. You remember old Kant, the philosopher, said, the sight of the starry skies above and the experience of conscience within me yearning for something higher convinces every man that there must be some kind of life after physical death. When you think of the accounts of civilizations that most of us have studied through the years, you remember that there isn't a civilization on the globe that has not had literature connected with this kind of thing. Every one of them has had literature or stories about someone who was trying to get some substance that would enable them to live forever. And almost every civilization, almost every literature, witnesses to that fact that men feel they ought to live forever. Uh, Ponce de Leon, you remember, uh, discovered uh, uh, the island of Puerto Rico. And when he discovered it, he was not looking for a paradise island. He was uh, looking for that elixir of life. That would rejuvenate them and keep them continually young. And uh, if you remember the stories in classical mythology, every mythology that you read, whatever nation it's connected with, has a hero of some kind who spends years and years searching for the fountain of eternal youth. It does seem that we men and women have always had the feeling that there is something more than what we have. And there's something better in life than what we possess at this moment. You know that what we've discovered in our studies of the presentation of the creator of the world that we get through Jesus, that in these studies we've begun to see that all this wishful thinking and this desperate yearning has really a basis in reality. That in fact, God did give us these physical and mental temporal abilities. But he also gave us another kind of power or substance that actually goes beyond the temporal. And that actually does last forever. Do you see, brothers and sisters, that it's because that is reality that we have so many corrupted versions of the search for that reality in the mythological looking and investigating after an elixir of life. It's strange. We men and women do not normally go off on some fairy tale unless there is some basis in reality for the kind of search that we're engaging upon. And you know that that search is found back in, oh, it's Genesis, if you like to look at it, Genesis 2 and seven through nine, and really all these ancient stories 
that we so often smile at and even the sublimation of these stories in our present desperate attempts in medicine, you remember. Because medicine in our day has now taken over the function that those mythological stories performed uh, in ancient times. And medicine now is engaged in trying to prolong at all costs the functions of the body uh, as long as men want. That's why we're involved in transplants of all kinds. We're now in medicine after the same thing, the, trying to satisfy the desire that all of us have, that we should live beyond the 70 or 80 year period. And you get the basis of all that search in Genesis 2 and verses 7 and 9. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being, or it's, the Hebrew word is nephesh, soul, you remember. And of course that refers to the physical, you see, the dust. And the soul is the Greek word suke, you remember. The Hebrew word nephesh, and it really means the psychological part of us. And so God gave us a physical and a psychological part both of which were temporal. And then in verse 9, you see, he made another kind of life available. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And of course, that tree had the quality that is described there in Genesis 3, you remember, and verse 22. Genesis 3 and 22 describes the quality of that tree of life. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And the quality of that second kind of life that God made available is that it enables us to live forever. That's one of the things it does. And really you see that the creator of the universe gave us this physical and mental life that is purely temporal. But he also made available another supernatural life force that would transform these abilities that we have and would enable them to actually go on forever. And that's why so many of us have this yearning. And it is reasonable, dear ones. That's the way we were made. We were made to sense that we were more than just temporal creatures. Now, God, of course, makes a complete distinction between those two kinds of lives. He makes a, an absolute dichotomy between the temporal kind of life that he provided and the supernatural kind of life that he provided. In fact, so strong does he make that dichotomy that he calls one life and the other he calls death. And he says, that's the choice that you people have actually before you. You can make do with this temporal life that is actually in my mind only death and will be death for you after 70 years or you can begin to receive this life that is life indeed, that enables you to live like me forever. Now, you find that uh, choice presented clearly in Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19, really right near the beginning of the Bible, Deuteronomy 30, 19, it's page 180, 180. And you see there the, the clear statement of our Creator to us in Deuteronomy 30, 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore choose life that you and your descendants may live. And that was really the choice that the Creator has set before us. Now, choosing life that supernatural life force that he provided did mean exerting dependent, loving intercourse with our Creator. And that you see in the next verse there, for instance. Uh, 20. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and cleaving to him. For that means life to you and length of days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord, sw Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So receiving that supernatural life does mean a, living a loving dependence on the Creator. Now, it was that very thing that the Creator of evil laid emphasis on when he persuaded us to make do with the physical and mental life that we have. 
It was that desire for independence that seems to be inside us that the creator of evil emphasized when he persuaded us to make do with just the physical and temporal and mental life that we possess. And so what happened was most of us believe that we have all the life we need when in fact we have only this temporal, physical and mental life. And we were persuaded of that because we thought it was sufficient for us at the time and would be sufficient forever. And uh, you can get that kind of approach by really the great deceiver in Genesis 3 and uh, verse 4. And there's no point, you see, in just looking back to this purely as a historical event. It is that. But the fact is that this deceiver is still involved with most of us today. And is still urging the same thing. But the serpent said to the woman, it's page 2, no one's. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. And really that has been his approach to us all through the years. This physical and mental life is all you need. It's enough for you. It's keeping you alive today. That's all you need. You don't need any more than that. And brothers and sisters, that's the problem with most of us. We really do think that what we've got is all we need. That's it. And that's really what sin is, you know. Sin is not just wanting to be independent of the creator of the galaxies and the creator of the rivers and the mountains. Sin is also a real deception. A real deception that we have all the life that we need. And that's really the problem with many of us, you know, in the theater this morning. It's really not, brothers and sisters, that we don't believe a lot of the right things. But many of us here are absolutely convinced that we have all the life that we need this morning. And that there is nothing deeper than the physical and mental life that we possess this moment. And that that talk about spiritual life is just its mythology. And many of us are utterly convinced that the life we have now is the only life we need. We're really, you know, a bit like uh, somebody going into the garage, turning on the old engine, sitting there with the window open, sitting, sitting. You can't smell the old carbon monoxide, you know. can't sense it coming in. It's just filling the car, filling it, and you're becoming fainter and fainter and wearier and wearier. And you don't know. It just comes like that. And it's a bit like that. We're involved in breathing in a kind of life that we don't know is death and that is in fact bringing us gradually to death, but we don't know it. And we're walking around thinking we haven't. And really, this applies even to those of us who know the rest of the story. There are many of us here this morning who know that God when he was faced with a bunch of rebels like ourselves refusing his supernatural life force, we know that he determined there and then to destroy us, lest we destroy his universe forever. And we know that at that moment his son agreed to face that death penalty of destruction on our behalf. And for that reason God has made available his supernatural life force of the Holy Spirit to us again. But there are many of us who believe all that and yet still have not received that life. Now, loved ones, do you see, it is possible to believe all the right things, and yet still not to be receiving that supernatural life force of the Holy Spirit that enables you to be an eternal supernatural being. Now, that is possible. And the, the tragedy is that many of us who have great pride in the old intellect are absolutely convinced that if we believe all that stuff about Jesus dying for our sins and we believe that God is willing to forgive us, then we must have received this life. Now, loved ones, no. It is possible to believe it all and yet not to receive that life. And so it is vital, you know, to see that that's why God set forth the verse that we're studying today. And that's why he did what this verse says. Maybe you'd look at it. It's, it's Romans and chapter 5 and verse 20. Romans 5 and 20.
It's page 981. 981. Law came in to increase the trespass. That that's why God made laws of life. It was as if, you know, many of us were living without the right vitamins. And you know, many of us do that. We just live and eat the old, uh, better not use any trade names, but you know, we eat the old greasy food and fill up the cholesterol and uh, we really aren't eating the right stuff at all. And it's as if God was looking at many of us not eating the right vitamins. And he comes down and says, look, the only way to persuade you people that you're not eating the right vitamins is to tell you, look, here are some of the laws of life. If you're eating the right vitamins, you'll have 20-20 vision. Okay, if you're eating the right vitamins, your pulse beat and your heartbeat will be such and such. If you're eating the right vitamins, this kind of thing will happen. And that's why God made the laws of life. He said, listen, you people, many of you believe the right things about me, but you still haven't received my supernatural life force of the Holy Spirit. Now look, if you receive this life force, these are the actions and the words that this life force produces in your life. Now, would you look at these laws of life and see if these describe the kind of life that you live? If they do, then you probably are receiving my supernatural life force. If you're not, then you're not receiving the life force. And that's why law came to us. It came to increase the sin in that sense to let us know that we were sinning. In other words, sin is independent of God. It's not depending on God. And as a result of not depending on Him, you don't receive the supernatural life force that He can give you through the Holy Spirit. And you go on believing that you have it, even though you haven't. That is sin. Now, God said, I want to show you that you're living in the midst of sin, so I want to increase your sense of sin by showing you the kind of life that people live who have this life force. Now that's why law came, you see. Law came in to increase the sin. It was to make our independence of God more obvious to us so that we actually realized what it was. Now, brothers and sisters, do you see what our attitude would be to one another if we did that in regard to leukemia. If some of us here had leukemia this morning and we just wouldn't believe it, and we didn't know that we had leukemia and we wouldn't seek any cure and we wouldn't seek any treatment, we just said, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then others of us find a book that outlines the symptoms of leukemia. And it says now, if you have leukemia, you'll have this, and you'll have this, and you'll have this. Now, brothers and sisters, can you sense our attitude to one another in that situation? Do you see, it wouldn't be one of condemnation. Don't you see that? It wouldn't be me going to, to John or, or going to Connie and saying, Look, look, you've got, you've got leukemia and I'm condemning you. You shouldn't be here at all. You just don't fit in with these symptoms of healthy life. Do you see there'd be no place for condemnation? Don't you see that we would be just loving each other together and we would be doing our best and praying for the other person that they would see their true state and they would see that they really had leukemia so that they would seek a cure and get some kind of life into their bodies that would drive out the disease. But do you see, brothers and sisters, that would be our attitude. There would be no attitude of using the laws of healthy life to condemn other people or to make them feel uncomfortable or to make them feel inferior. Rather, there would be an attitude of love towards each other that urged each other to see your true state. Now, brothers and sisters, do you see that that's the attitude God wants us to take to the law? He wants us to use the law as a diagnostic tool to see our true state. In other words, if God's law says, Thou shalt not covet, and you know fine well 
that you're coveting like mad that sheepskin coat in Dayton's window. Or you're coveting like mad the duster. Or you're coveting like mad the Triumph 600, you know. If you know fine well, your mind is set on that. Your mind goes round and round. How will I get another $50 to get that thing? And, you know, coveting is just that. Don't let's get all academic about coveting. You know, it's when your mind is on the thing again and again, every time you have any leisure, or any leisure. Uh, it's hard to learn American. <laughs> Now, if you find yourself coveting, do you see what you ought to do is you ought to look in and say, now, is my attitude to possessions the attitude of Jesus? The spirit of Jesus sits very loosely by possessions because he's aware that the, all the possessions in the world belong to his father and his father can give them to him at any time that he thinks he needs them. Now, is my attitude to my possessions the attitude of the Spirit of Jesus? Or am I, in fact, grasping at these things because I feel I have to get them because I'm not sure whether God knows I need them or not and I'm not sure whether he could give me them or not? But, brothers and sisters, the approach should be look in and see is my attitude to possessions the attitude of the supernatural Spirit of Jesus or the supernatural life force that God gives me? And if it isn't, then that life force is not working in me, at least in regard to my possessions. And possibly not working in me at all, but certainly not working in me in that regard. But do you see that that's the attitude, loved ones? The attitude is not, oh, well, I, I don't have a pale face, I don't have the symptoms of leukemia. No, I don't. I don't have those symptoms. That's a silly attitude, you see. Will you pretend, no, I don't covet. Well, I may just uh, be a little interested in that motorbike, but I don't really covet. No, be sensible. The law came in to increase the sin, to make it obvious where you stood. That's the beautiful thing about Christianity, you know. You don't need to be in doubt. You don't need to say, well, I think I'm a Christian, or I'm not sure I'm a Christian. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. No, I was feeling pretty good yesterday, but don't feel so good today. <laughs> It just, it just is not that kind of deal. You see, it's not that kind of deal. It's not, uh, I'm a Christian because I don't wear uh, cut-offs, you know, at summer camp. Or, um, <laughs> or I'm a Christian because I don't go to the theater. It's not that kind of deal. It's a straight, plain system. The life of the Holy Spirit is described in the laws of life. God says, if you are filled with the life of my Holy Spirit, then you'll have no other gods before me, then you won't take my name in vain, then you won't covet, then you won't commit adultery. These are promises. These are things that will automatically happen if my life force is running through you. And so our attitude should be, well, is this life force in me? Or you come to the business of envy, and you find that, the Bible says that envy is obviously a, a, a work of the flesh and is not God's will for us. Then what you ought to do is look inside and say, now is my attitude to my friends and to others the attitude of Jesus of Nazareth? Do I want the best for them? Do I want them to be better than me? What is my attitude to their achievements? What's my attitude to their successes or to their failures? Am I willing to be nothing compared with my friends? Am I willing to be what Jesus was, a complete failure, so that my friends really should succeed? And ask yourself, loved ones, is the spirit of Jesus moving within you? Because here's the fact. If that spirit is moving within you, you won't envy. You see, you won't envy. And the thing is not to say, oh, I do envy, I do envy, so I mustn't envy. I must stop envying. I'm not going to envy today. No envy today. No, that's silly, you see. Because you're trying to persuade yourself and God and everybody else that you have this life force within you when obviously the symptoms of your own life show that you haven't. Now, it's the same with all those sins, you know, that you can think of. It doesn't matter which one you take. Coveting, envy, ambition, greed, all those things. Don't look at them, loved ones, as something that you try to avoid. 
look at them as symptoms of purely temporal life within you and see that if they're there, you're going to die anyway after 70 years. And what you need to do is to get down to receiving this life force that God has. Now I think, you see, this is utterly opposite to the attitude that the law causes in many people. In many people, the law increases sin in a different way. Many people look at the laws and they say, well, I don't have those things in my life, but I can be that if I want to on my own without God's help. And I'm going to be that. And they begin to be self-righteous. And that's the only thing worse than pretending that you haven't leukemia, you know. That's the only thing worse than, than avoiding the fact that you have leukemia. Uh, putting cosmetics on your face and trying to make yourself look healthy and pretending that you're deliberately healthy when you're not. And that's what many of us do with the law. And that's why Christianity for many of us becomes a terrible burden. It becomes a great sack that we carry on our backs where we try to obey all the laws to prove to ourselves and to God and to our friends that we're Christians. Don't you see it's getting it backwards, love, loved ones? It's getting it backwards. You don't tackle the law like that. You tackle the laws as laws of life and laws of death. If I commit adultery, if I lust, if I envy, if I covet, then there's some of temporal life running through me that I need to exchange for God's life. And brothers and sisters, every time that independence and rebellion freshes inside you, Remember that God is more gracious than all your independence and all your rebellion. And God will always be willing to give you that life force. But it is vital for you to ask. You see, that's, what, that's really what today's verse is about, you know. Uh, if you look at it, Romans 5 and 20. Law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And brothers and sisters, the Father above us and the Father round about us and within us today is willing to give you the life of the Holy Spirit if you will admit that you do not have him and that you need him. But the law is here to undeceive us, not to get us to try to pretend that we're alive when we're not. And do you see what our attitude should be towards one another? Do you see why, loved ones, I can't stand up here and condemn you, you know, and say, oh, you envy, you're jealous, you're worse than me. That isn't the attitude we take. If we really love each other, we'll be saying to each other and praying for each other, look, look, that temporal life that you have within you, it's going to go out after 70 years. Look, you need to receive the eternal supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Now, don't you see that you need it? You see? And it's that kind of attitude. And usually, to be honest with you, the thing is not to talk to each other even like that. We should have that attitude to each other. But we should not preach to each other. We should live healthy lives so that anybody who is sick can see they're sick and can begin to seek that life that heals. So brothers and sisters, do you see that the law is a friend, a dear friend to us? The laws of life that God has given us are good and are to be loved by us. And we thank you, Father, for listing the symptoms for us so clearly and showing us that the answer is to go to you, a loving Father, gracious beyond anything that we could imagine, and to ask you again 